program, we will do mat work the ancient way. We're going to start off with a breath power control technique, uh, Aiki Age and Kataguruma. Uh, we'll move from there into the actual mat work, but uh, for now we're going to start with the first uh, training session. Aiki power is derived, uh, as we said, through the practice of uh, age and sage, which is the raising of the, the sword and the lowering of the sword. Um, by practicing putting our power into our opponent and uh, learning how to guide his resistance and his power, so that reflexively, at first we're practicing while he's grabbing us, and uh, this is out of sensitivity that I'm able to do this. So I'm going to first put my power into him, and then uh, steer him to the ground. It's okay. Okay, let go. Um, first, I'm forcing my power into him. That causes his resistance. Then I can steer his resistance, usually by um, drawing one hand and leading the other or vice versa, or sometimes a combination of both. This exercise is for sensitivity <coughs> in this drill. Later, you'll be able to do the same thing by grabbing your opponent, or different parts of your opponent, or even by the gi. But it's most effectively uh, transmuted by this exercise. Once again, first. Um, various forms of standing and seated technique for this for this training. Um, we did earlier the standing form of kataguruma or shoulder wheel, and now we have a seated version of the same technique. Grabs good. Basically, this exercise um, for a uh, shoulder wheel is a process of floating your opponent. So once again, when you float your opponent, you know that um, you, you're in a sense faking him because you're causing him to rise and you're rising with him. But there's going to be a point where you cause yourself to sink under his center and still cause his center to rise over. Um, that's the crucial part of timing. Um, the first thing that allows you to get the, the maximum float out of the technique is that when you do the age or rising technique you turn your uh, fingers up until the point where the backs of your fingers are at least up against his arms. Um, the second thing is very important not to just move your hands but to actually flex. If you see he's grabbing me now sort of flaccid but if you watch the reaction in his arms when I actually flex I'm flexing the tendons in my hands and arms and I'm uh, using all of my breath At that point, he's using a lot of energy to try to hold me back. That's the resistance that I'm riding. When I float him, um, I'm floating him up, and when I begin to go under him, I'm putting my head under and causing him to almost trip over me. Uh, at this point, I will stand up and use the back of my head and my back, but I have to make sure that my center is low enough on him so that he will, in fact, go over. Good, Joey. Grip good. Tie your belt. Okay. It's important when you do the grip um, that at some point, let go for a second, at some point when you go from up to down, you're actually going up and then down and around so that the motion will be up down and around you will be passing through that loop <laughs> the 
part of the strategy for network, um, especially the ancient way, you have to keep in mind that you're training to do something on a battlefield, not in a mixed martial arts uh, arena. Um, a lot of it involves that you're not committed to being locked into the ground um, with an opponent because you have to consider fighting when there are many people around. So the mat work as it was derived in those days, um, this was the ideal position. Not that guard position or mounted position or many of the lowercase jujitsu uh, holds and hold downs, not that they're not effective, is that you're striving to stay in this position. It's the most pristine, the most balanced and uh, the most effective in a sense. What you have to realize is that the techniques that we do standing are completely transposable to the ground. So that every technique that we know standing up, every technique that we know standing up from Ikkyo to entering throw, we can do on the ground with equal body movement. In fact, when you move around on the mat in actual randuri or combat on the mat, you tend to move in the same form, even sliding step. And this is how you want to uh, negotiate the mat. Um, again, nobody's attacking like this, so you want to learn the techniques on the mat from sword hand or from catch. But later you have to acknowledge that at some point, especially with mat work, you're going to deal with clinch. And a clinch situation is just most common. Um, for example, I want to do an ikkyo to my opponent. I'm not going to wait for him to do this, and I'm not going to wait for him to grab my hand. What I am going to do is uh, elicit response by hitting him. When he sees that I'm hitting him, he's got to do something to defend. Now I can take an ikkyo effectively. Remember we said that ikkyo is driving his elbow to his head, causing him to resist. Now I can steer his balance. Even with one hand, I can tip him over, so long as I'm aiming this to here, not across his body, because now I'm just wrestling his body's power. I'm not even affecting his equilibrium up into his head now is his equilibrium. <clears throat> Let's say that uh, he doesn't care I'm hitting him, so he does not give me anything to do an ikkyo with, but instead he grabs. From this position, to make ikkyo, or the effective ikkyo, I'm still going to drive his elbow to his head, but I'm going to use this hand as uh, my secondary balance. I'm actually going to pull down and at some point lose this grip like this. If we tie it up like this, or my opponent is trying to grip my body, I want to regrip until I reach this tie-up point. Is sufficient. Um, entering throw would be done off of an ikkyo. So if we look at how an entry throw is done traditionally, I'm passing an ikkyo, but I'm not able to pin my opponent. I've cut my ikkyo by, and now he's caused to try to stand up out of this. I have my entering throw. From traditional, from a clinch, same premise. I'm using this only as a stabilizer. I'm going to pass his elbow to his head this hand has come back. Once again, from the clinch. Okay. The beauty of this type of training is that rather than having to go down to the ground um, in order to submit my opponent or control the situation, I can actually feasibly control the situation simply by doing techniques left to right and right to left. <clears throat> Come closer. Come closer. So that uh, in the process, my opponent, here I have control. I can let go, and if my opponent is rising, I can continue on with the idea of ikkyo 
to either side. He's clinching. First control is to IT what a jab is to boxing, but there are some times, like in boxing, that you don't set up a big punch with a, a jab. Likewise, uh, entering throw doesn't have to always be set up off of a first control. So uh, we're going to do a small exercise in entering directly. Entering directly usually relies on one sliding step. So on our knees, a sliding step looks like this, or like this to that side. For entering throw, what we're going to do is, I'm going to pick a side. I'm going either to first base or to third base. So in this case, I will go to first base. When I go to first base, I'm acting as though there's an invisible barrier, and I'm going to guide myself as though I'm pulling myself on this barrier that way. It looks like this. Uh, the pantomime should be done in a beat of two. Beat of two is uh, slide in, cut down. When usually this is taught, usually you're taught to wait for a strike or wait for a blow to the head and then sidestep. doesn't work that way. That's just to learn the mechanics. What you're going to do is, in effect, invite your opponent by, as you start to move up the baseline, the shoulder will become the invisible barrier. By touching his shoulder, you're going to cause him to give a little resistance in. In other words, you're never going to do this and your opponent will fall over. But when I do this, he's going to lean into it. It's also going to help my throw. So the beat in two should look like this. One, two. Once again, uh, it's nice to wind up. I use my other hand as a guide and I'm, I'm keeping him from in case he rushed. I can stop him out. Um, this hand, just so. Outside. Right side. This is a direct form of entering throw. But like with all techniques, we're planning that we don't get the first one. We're planning that the first one is to set him up to be guided into a secondary approach. So that what we have with entering throw is a cut to the neck and uh, a stall. So I'm going to cut to his neck. We're going to imagine he's too powerful for me to cut down. At this point, I'm going to start turning the other way. Much like in competitive entering throw, I'm going to use this action to slingshot me in another direction. successfully negotiate the mat uh, with the partner uh, depends on you putting these segments together and uh, consolidating or quantifying them so that there are only so many positions you can wind up in. There are only so many things that can happen to you provided you keep this as your primary position and you're always striving to be working from this position. There are times when you go from this position into submission and you, you violate this position but that's when you're pretty sure that you're on your way to defeating your opponent and it's with a submission or a choke. Um, for right now, we're going to address two things that you have to deal with. Even though we say that we as Aikido practitioners don't do guard and uh, we don't do um, no-holds-barred style grappling, other people do. So we have to be able to do uh, or to deal with these techniques as they're going to happen to us. So right now, the first one I'd like to deal with is the guard position, a basic guard pass, so that uh, Joey will put me in his guard. Never mind how we get here. Hook, hook your legs. 
this is a fundamental position in competitive fighting today. Um, we're going to use the premise of first control to pass it, and then um, uh, later we're going to add to that. But for now, usually in guard is the opponent is pulling you in. First thing we're doing is we're regaining this position. That is, I'm sitting erect in seiza or, or kneeling position, and I'm even waiting uh, just to see what he'll do. While I have him flattened out, he may punch, um, he may try to come up to clinch. I'm not so concerned with that. In one beat, I'm going to break his uh, lock with his ankles, first by just forcing out pressure, and second, if it doesn't break by that, I'm going to insert one hand in front and one hand in behind in one beat. Hook your feet. Okay. In one beat, if I left only one hand in, I can be leg choked or arm barred. Um, I'm shooting two hands in. Nothing will happen to me except maybe punch, but I'm planning that by the time any attack should happen, I'm going to perform my ikkyo. If you can see, let's turn this way for a second. Hook your feet. When your hands are through, to make space, simply uh, grabbing your own foot and uh, arching your wrist out makes pressure to make the break. From here you can see the way we're going to pass is just like ikkyo or first control, we're going to pass the leg. Done from this perspective. Regaining my posture, breaking the guard. I'm passing and turning in so that I've locked him with my knee. Next is I'm going to secure this hand with an ikkyo to his head. I'm going to enter and turn over his body. This is the goal uh, that we're aiming for. Along the way when we do this, we may run into obstruction that we can't get here, but this is where you aim every time. So we'll do this a couple of times. fundamental maneuver in mixed martial arts, the choke. Um, <clears throat> we're going to use a conventional Aikido technique, third control, to escape the choke. In fact, the technique we're going to use is derived straight from Daitoryu, the predecessor of Aikido, and we're going to do it as much to that traditional form as possible because I think it's the most effective. So we're going to start off with uh, a slow rendition of this and then uh, try to speed it up a little bit to give you real time. <sighs> Most importantly, will be the first part to escape the choke. Then, reaching up, reaching up with my hand curled already, keeping the curl and the elbow high so that when I pull the elbow down, uh, by the time my elbow reaches here, I should have broken his grip like this. In breaking it down, uh, we want to address the most important fundamental point, which is uh, to block the choke. When you go, uh, do your block for the choke, you want to reach in with a curled hand, um, elbow very high, and the more you can curl your hand on the first grasp, the better. A, a highly curled hand, when the elbow comes down, will have a, like a, a vice-like effect to pry the hand open. But if you grab straight, 
even though your elbow is high, you won't have much leverage so that when you bring the elbow down, you won't have enough torque to be able to break the grip. Um, and the next thing will be that uh, from this point, I break the grip down. As soon as I can peel his hand away, I need to reassert the third control grip right away and then pass my head under and his arm over. Um, so let's demonstrate from standing position at first, just like this, like this reaching up with a curl. Now, to peel the hand open and break the grip. From here, I'm reversing the grip and pass under to the other side. Now, effectively, I'm on his back, he's not on mine. Um, when this is done from uh, his legs around me, I will simply reach through, take the leg and pass it over. Then uh, I'll be behind his leg and his arm in this position. Okay, to take my back. begin now with kata for randori, which is uh, the forms that you're going to use in the successions that you're going to use them. And when I say that, I mean you tend to not want to do two techniques in a row to an opponent, at least not the same side. Um, so you want to have a mentality of rocks, scissors, paper. Uh, the best way to train this is to do it from the mat. And I'll explain the reason why uh, very succinctly. Don't move. No, you stay there. When you're standing and you do maneuvers, your tendency is to do a maneuver and when you're done, to take extra steps. When you practice from kneeling, you lose the option of any extra steps. You're either uh, shuffling in or pivoting and turning and that's the point at which you rest. You don't have the time or the space to take an extra step. So you'll be conditioned to do your techniques one after the other with no extraneous movement. Then when you go to standing, your habit will be no extraneous movement. Um, one technique I like to practice randori on the mat with is kote gaeshi or wrist return. Um, it can be done in, in any manner of grab or it can be done uh, catch style, which is I, I trick him into taking this hand and I replace with this hand. As soon as you begin kote gaeshi, uh, remember that most of your enter and turns are done on your knees, so they don't feel like uh, you're not taking steps with your feet. You're simply allowing yourself to pivot on your knee and uh, make like this. Back step looks like this, forward pivot, back pivot, like that. Usually when you start, a good axiom is to go around your opponent in a circle uh, or else do a technique right and then do a technique left. So right now I'm going to do a technique right. From this position, I'm going to let him rise. I don't want to back away. As soon as he's on the rise, he's coming. He's coming. Another way to practice uh, in succession, if you're not so good at the catch style where you're, you're baiting and catching, is to simply do it from hand grasp, both hands grab. Um, in this case, a good technique to practice is third control. Third control, why? Um, because he's giving you the grasp, you don't have to work too hard to keep, keep it. So third control and four directions throw tend to be the same throw. What really matters for these techniques is that you pass under your opponent's armpit with a spin and come out the other side. You keep, keep. 
This is a third control. This is a fourth control. If he keeps the grip and I cut down, he's coming up. I give him this hand. First control. This is excellent way to ingrain in your body the moves so that you do not have to think about them. No one's going to grab you like this in Renduri, but just by doing this, Later, you're familiar with which ways that you can go, then Uh, series of V-choke uh, from high collar grip. It's the most common situation we'll wind up in and from there first look at it as just a control and later look at it as a submission. Uh, from high collar grip without the gi we're just hooking the neck and the arm and holding in tight. Holding in tight is, is one side of the head or the other just tight to the body elbows inside. Uh, if you're doing a good high collar grip don't have your elbows up don't allow your opponent to be able to get into your body, so elbows in is very important. Now, for the first case, I'm going to take his gi from the back. I've got my thumb inside, and I've got my fingers on the outside. Now I've just bunched it up. From this position, I'm going to take this hand, and I'm going to duck his head under. So now coming up onto this side, this is simply effective as a post. So if I need to turn him to the ground, it's very easy. Post, post, turn to the ground. Thumb high collar grip, uh, thumb inside the back of the gi, grip up a bunch of the gi. Push his head under and at the same time, loop your elbow over. Now secure it. Across his neck, I'm going to post right inside and turn like steering wheel. Effective. Next will be, high collar grip. Next will be, uh, we're going to apply the choke while standing. While standing is very easy, um, although you're giving up a little bit of yourself, if you hold it right for long enough, you won't have to worry about it. First is to duck his head under, then I'm going to reach in and grab opposite lapel. Uh, you tap, when you feel it, uh, if you're very high in the neck, you'll feel that it's a little bit harder to put pressure on to choke. If you come down a little on the lapel so that you're lower, it's more like piano wire. So I'm going to cut into his neck with my hand. Whereas if I'm up higher, sometimes uh, the act of my hand being in there can make a little bit of space and help him. So it just depends on the opponent and uh, his ability to withstand the choke. I call it grip, thumb inside the gi duck his head under, now post. Reaching under, either very deep or very low on the lapel. Pulling the lapel across the throat and pushing the wrist like this so that I'm cutting right in. Cutting in. Also a choke on the ground. If you hold the same position, this one into the neck and this one across, like so. Okay, next is a simple choke from the rear. Simple choke from the rear because uh, there are a few different ways that you can put on the choke, um, but there's one that happens like that. 
And so we're considering that uh, we get behind an opponent and we're able to reach around and grab just one piece of lapel. From this position, that's all I want. I don't need to reach and grab the other piece. It's a fine choke, but this one's a little bit simpler as far as I'm concerned, is to hold this one deep across the neck. I'm going to shoot this hand in uh, very abruptly, up high and chop behind the neck. Turn and face. Up high and behind the neck. When I bring it up high, the pressure of his arm, he's in resistance, so he's starting to pull down. So when he begins to pull down on his arm, I'm chopping in the neck to stop him from stopping my resistance. Now we're ready to move on to advanced training, which is Renduri, or uh, free sparring for the mat and you should do a lot of this in your training and don't neglect it. Once you feel you have enough put together where you can perform Renduri effectively, you should try to do it every day in training. So let's begin. Hope you enjoyed this program, Mat Work the Ancient Way. Um, I trust you see the need to uh, incorporate these types of training in your daily Aikido routine. Uh, I hope you enjoy it and I hope you never give up. Thank you very much. With 
something like Aikido, it's not a specific technique. Aiki is uh, simply riding your opponent's uh, force. And so you could do Aikido with boxing. In fact, if you ask me, Roy Jones is as good an Aikido practitioner as any Aikido master. Most techniques are, are absorbed from a weapon. Judo is Aikido. Most techniques are based or taken from the sword or the spear. Tennis is Aikido. Aikido means that I'm harmonizing with you. Basically, I'm trying to solicit a response from you, and, uh, and when I get that response, I'm going to steer that response into a favorable position. And that's Aiki. It's not the particular technique. It's what you're doing with the opponent's energy. How did you first get interested in the martial arts? Um, I first got interested in martial arts when uh, I was a very small boy. I actually remember hearing on TV about the death of Bruce Lee, and I must have been three or four. And somehow that struck me, that stuck with me. And then um, any time I ever saw anything related to martial arts, it was just one of those things born in you. When I was a kid and when I was in my early 20s, uh, I think like a lot of people, I was astounded by the speed of Bruce Lee. Um, if you catch the right footage, you can see a human being that could literally move faster than the eye could see. Um, so that was a phenomenon, and I think a lot of us were chasing that phenomenon. And as time went on, I started to see other things, and I started to see things differently. And, um, you know, all the time you're trying to simplify what you do and quantify it, and that's really what gravitated me towards the uh, Aikido as, as a martial art, because the, the cue and the structure of the cue is very simple. Um, and easier to assimilate into your, into your structure. If you can't immerse yourself to a degree in it, it's not worth it even to, to participate. I mean, if, you, if you're looking at it to look and say, wow, that's really cool and I like watching these tapes, that's one thing. But if you're not prepared to immerse yourself into it and uh, really think of it almost as a religion, and the reason for that is because in this practice, your life depends on it. And if you don't take it that serious, somebody will get hurt and it's not worth it for that, for, for fun. Have you tried using specific moves of Aikido in combat? Yes, I, I have in fact. Um, a, a number of the things that you see on these tapes, like uh, escaping a choke with a third control technique, I've done it. Uh, entering throw, I've done it. And a lot of these techniques I've done in fights that I lost. I've done entering throws in fights that I lost, but I got the entering throw off. Um, uh, I've had over 50 fights in Japan alone. Um, I mean, I've been fighting all my life, and if you actually had to count how many professional fights I've had, that's including going into people's dojos and picking fights, it's a lot more than 50. If I counted on my hands uh, the number of fighters that I have worked with who have gone on to become champion of this and champion of that, these are guys who uh, I have never been able to tap me in a dojo, and I've tapped them hundreds of times, thousands of times, and a lot of fighters try to compete with that by saying, uh, let's say they embellish their records or their careers or what they've done. Um, and I hear it from guys that I've trained and taught and uh, I get no acknowledgement of being the guy who trained them or taught them um, or, or even helped them. And a lot of guys are turning around and trying to pretend like, uh, you know, they're my teacher. I'm old. There are guys who have held a lot more titles than me. I've been doing this a lot more years than they have. Um, so what I say, I say with a great deal of experience. I was actually the first ultimate fighting fighter to ever fight Hoist Gracie because I fought him in his dojo before the UFC ever existed. I had been in Los Angeles for a while and uh, I needed money and I had just heard about them. A friend of mine had told me about them and I called him up and I asked him, is it true? And he said, yeah. And uh, a story I like to tell is is uh, aside from the fact that none of us in professional fighting would have jobs if it wasn't for Horry and Gracie, but uh, I called him up and uh, I bet, he said, you can bet if you want. And so I said, I'll bet. I said, I bet you 600 bucks. And he said, uh, he said, okay. And it was slated to be about two weeks later and then about the day before the fight, he called me up and he said, uh, he said, let's forget the bet. So in my head, I'm thinking, oh, the guy must be afraid. But, uh, I get to the fight and we fight in the dojo and I lose. And then after the fight, he said, uh, well, look at it this way. He says, you won 600 bucks. And I asked him, I said, uh, how come you canceled that bet? And he said, uh, he said, 500 bucks is a bet. 
He said, a thousand bucks is a bet, but 600 bucks is rent. And so I could kind of tell he'd been there at some point. He'd been uh, out, out on his luck, and I appreciated that. And uh, not to mention, I appreciated the fact that we all had good jobs for a long time because of UFC and everything he did. Originally, before I fought Hoist Gracie in his dojo, I moved to Los Angeles uh, to answer a challenge that uh, Steven Seagal made in Black Belt Magazine. Uh, he said that anybody who wanted to fight him could go to his dojo and challenge him and uh, be prepared to fight to the death. So I went uh, with a written challenge, uh, and I went every day, morning and night, um, even through the Los Angeles riots, uh, and I waited, and he never came. But, uh, you know, that's the kind of crazy things you do when you're a kid. In my view, all styles amount to the same thing. Um, I think all styles, if you go to uh, Southeast Asia, to Burma, you go to Thailand, um, all the old masters are practicing some soft form, uh, usually a two-sword form or a spear form, looks very much like Tai Chi. Um, tai Chi is the Chinese version of Aiki, and they all have the, the same ending form. Um, varies, but it's basically the same in the end. Aiki in any sport is uh, based on your mastery of it, and that's all it is.